afternoon. My name is Patrick Doherty. I'm the Deputy Director of the New America Foundation's American Strategy Program. Uh, it's the foreign policy program here at uh, New America. Um, and we have about 41 scholars uh, at, at, and staff as part of that program here. Um, one of our main focuses is, uh, is terrorism, and we're actually in the process of developing a, a, our first program, uh, incredibly, given that we've had um, Peter Bergen here as a senior fellow for many years. Uh, but Steve Cole uh, is now our president. You may know him as the author of Ghost Wars, um, and uh, which won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is and this, this, is, this event, um, which we're calling Martyrs Without Borders, is part of that larger process that we haven't yet launched. But what we want to do is start looking at some of the dynamics in, um, in the, the phenomena of terrorism, um, whether it's suicide bombers or madrasas, and create better, uh, and create access to and create new, better data about what's really going on. Um, and today we're especially pleased to have Mohammed Hafez uh, with us to talk about this phenomenon of, of uh, uh, suicide bombers um, and the transnational dynamics um, associated with that. Um, what's driving them? Uh, where are they going? Um, in the last few years uh, since um, the, um, the spike in violence in Iraq, what is really happening with this, with this uh, phenomenon? Um, what can we expect? What's next? How is Al-Qaeda and other uh, affiliated or non-affiliated groups thinking about uh, this, uh, how to utilize uh, the, the tactic of suicide bombing? Um, and today we have to speak on that, a, a great expert in the, in the field. Um, he's written two books on it. Um, his first was called Manufacturing Human Bombs, The Making of Palestinian Suicide Bombers. Um, by USIP Press. And then his current one, um, which is just out, is called Suicide Bombers in Iraq, um, the strategy and ideology of, of martyrdom. Uh, Mohammed is a visiting professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, again, the topic here is going to be about um, martyrs without borders, what helps explain the volunteer phenomenon, um, and what can we expect to see in the future. Um, and the way we'll structure this is Mohammed will speak for about a half hour. Uh, and then I'll ask a question and then we'll open up to the floor. So um, with that, if we could welcome Mohammed. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. It is always a pleasure and an honor to be invited to, uh, to speak uh, to you, especially on a beautiful Friday uh, afternoon. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to Peter Bergen because I know he recommended me for this and Patrick for the very kind introduction. Now to me as a social scientist, nothing is more intriguing than this phenomena of suicide terrorism. What gets an individual to strap explosives around his, his or her body, uh, walk into crowded public places and blow themselves up in order to kill others? What's uh, even more intriguing, what we've noticed uh, of late, is this phenomena of what I call martyrs without borders, of individuals that leave their home country, which is not necessarily a conflict zone, and go to a conflict zone in order to fight and often engage in suicide attacks. A Tunisian living in Italy makes his way to Iraq. A Belgium uh, woman uh, with her husband living in uh, uh, Belgium make their way to Iraq to fight and carry out suicide attacks. This is very difficult for social scientists to explain, particularly those that deal with issues of social movements and political violence and terrorism. One of the main problems in social science is how do you explain collective action? That is, individuals fighting or doing something, not necessarily for their own personal gain, but for a broader cause. When you have a, a situation where people are urging you to go and do something for a collective good, you have a, there's this phenomena of uh, free riding. The individuals are more likely to free ride, say, no, thank you. If you succeed, the best to you. But I'd rather stay home and not assume the risk, the costs. Um, and, and if the benefits come, great. So what explains this? You have individuals living in one country making their way to another to carry out a suicide attack. And this phenomena is not a marginal one. It is a growing one. 
Um, if we look at the data in, uh, on suicide attacks worldwide, when they first began in the contemporary era, when we're looking about 1980s to 2001, so a period of about 21 years or 20 years, what we have is about 235 suicide attacks worldwide. So from 1981, when we have the first recorded attack, to September 11th, we have about 235 suicide attacks. Yet since September 11th till about this uh, August of this year, we have a six-fold increase, about 1,300, actually a lot more now. Uh, so a six-fold increase in the number of suicide bombings. This is really, a suge this suggests that this is a growing phenomena, a rising trend line, not one that is declining. Moreover, the suicide attacks are no longer uh, sort of limited to those traditional conflict uh, areas. As of uh, 1994, suicide attacks mainly took place in two countries, in Lebanon and in Sri Lanka by the Tamil Tigers. But since 1994, what we have are at least 27 countries that have been attacked by suicide bombings and countries that never experienced suicide bombings, like Iraq prior to 2003, Afghanistan that had few but almost none um, uh, until about 2004, 2005, and certainly this year being the worst year for them. Um, Algeria, Morocco, in Europe, and now in Pakistan. So what this suggests is that this phenomenon, again, is expanding, not just simply rising in the number of attacks, but also expanding across countries. As of uh, my data, about 27 countries have experienced suicide bombings so far. Um, and also the number of organizations that are adopting this. Initially, it was Hezbollah and the Tamil Tigers, but then it moved to the Palestinians and now Al-Qaeda, and there are various organizations. So this is spreading throughout the board. Now, it's not a puzzle to, to uh, understand why organizations or groups would deploy suicide bombers. I think the consensus in academia and in the literature is that this is actually a rather rational tactic, even though it has a fanatical aura around it. It's quite rational. And there are four strategic or tactical and strategic things that make this a rational uh, tactic for groups. One, suicide attacks have a tactical advantage. They kill more people on average than a conventional attack. Statistically, suicide attacks tend to kill about 12 people, whereas conventional attacks about one and sometimes none. So you have a 12 to 1 ratio. More importantly, suicide bombers are smart bombs. They can go to the target. If they see that the target is heavily secured, they could go to another target. I mean, there's actually plenty of anecdotes about this, particularly from the Palestinian case, where a bomber would go, seize a mall, heavily secured, would go to somewhere else, or to a bus stop, or to a, a cafe. Um, there's even an incident where a suicide bomber was uh, noticed, and he was being chased by Israeli uh, security forces. He ran and found a bus stop where people were gathering and blew himself up there. So no smart bomb can do that. Even the most expensive laser-guided missiles cannot make those tactical adjustments in the final seconds. And we know that suicide attacks garner media attention. On average in Iraq, there are 70, 80, or 100 uh, attacks a day, but usually it is the suicide bombings in the heart of Baghdad that capture media attention. Another advantage is what could be called strategic communication or propaganda. Suicide attacks deliver the message that we are so determined to win that nothing deters us. As Al-Qaeda loves to say, or people, uh, affiliates of Al-Qaeda would always say, is that we love death as much as you love life. And so this suggests that, delivers the message that we are so determined, our cause is so righteous, that we are willing to die for it. Psychologically speaking, if you are trying to coerce another country, suicide attacks can be a rather effective coercive tactic because you are, the, the message that the people get is this is an unprecedented threat. These are not cases, they're crazies. You can't even deter them. So that delivers also a heavy psychological burden on the society. All the research also shows that after a while, societies are attacked again and again. You get the normalization effect. And so there's a diminishing return to suicide attacks on that psychological front. Uh, but nonetheless, it can be uh, rather uh, troubling. What the key about suicide attacks is they turn mundane things, going to a cafe, going to um, a, uh, a subway station, riding a bus, getting on a plane, they turn those daily things into hazards. And that can take, uh, have a psych heavy psychological toll on people.
And finally, for organizations, it's important to engage, or some organizations in, engage in suicide attacks because it gives them a certain amount of legitimacy. We are the most sacrificing. We are the most effective. We kill more of the enemy than all the other groups. And so if you're in a, in a, in a competitive field, Hamas versus Fatah versus PFLP, you know, others, having that kind of tactic in your arsenal can gain you a lot of popular support if indeed this is uh, seen as a legitimate tactic. So these are the reasons that help explain why organizations do it. And in that respect, it's not really a puzzle. But why do individuals agree to fulfill the organizational needs of uh, these uh, groups or big organizations? Why do they agree to take it upon themselves to strap a bomb or ride in the car that's uh, laden with explosives? That I still think uh, we don't have an answer to. And I try to give a modest one in my book, but I have to admit it is really just a theory. It's not much, and, and it's much more historically and contextually based than one that could explain this across the board. So let me turn to Iraq, which is the focus of the book. Um, and let me just give you a basic statistic. Iraq, prior to 2003, had zero suicide attacks. Since then, as of August uh, 2007, Iraq has had 838 suicide bombings. And, uh, uh, and now, if that means that if you take the K Iraq and put it in one basket with all the suicide attacks, and all the other suicide attacks combined worldwide, Hamas, Hezbollah, Tamil Tigers, and put them in another basket, Iraq would still weigh more. So this is really uh, a troubling phenomenon. And increasingly, Afghanistan has, has become the second nation in which suicide attacks take place. This year, 2007, Iraq has had 290 suicide attacks. So this has been the worst year for Iraq in terms of suicide bombings. The research, uh, one more thing about suicide attacks in Iraq is that most suicide attacks there do not target coalition forces or American forces. Most suicide attacks, first and foremost, attack Iraqi police and the new security forces that are being established. And secondly, civilians, particularly Shiite civilians, in their festivals, mosques, uh, markets, and things of that sort. And so this is really more about producing sectarian conflict and collapsing the Iraqi state, preventing it from having sole monopoly on the use of force to try to deprive that state of, uh, of an ability to survive as, um, uh, as all the other states in the region uh, have. Um, so let me sort of skip now, move away from the data and really get to the heart of this. W what is this about? What, what, what prompted such rapid volunteerism to Iraq? One thing that I didn't mention is that most suicide attacks in Iraq, at, at least as of 2006, have been carried out by foreigners. So the data collected both by the military and recently there was a New York Times article that dealt with this, but uh, just generally from my own data collection and others, is that we noticed that most suicide attacks in Iraq have been carried out by foreigners. A large percentage come from Saudi Arabia, but there are uh, others. So the, what we are dealing with is a phenomenon of transnational volunteerism. And those individuals that make it to Iraq often are sent into suicide missions, suicide uh, bombings. Um, so what prompted such rapid volunteerism to Iraq? And who are these volunteers? Why, where do they come from? And what are their backgrounds? And what motivates them to first go to Iraq and secondly engage in suicide attacks? And um, how, are the, how are they mobilized in the direction of Iraq? Not just in the technical sense of how are they recruited, but generally what are the themes that seem to bring them there? And what do the, what they say on what, why they have gone to Iraq? Let me point to six factors that I think are quite important in explaining this phenomenon of martyrs without borders person leaving his country going to Iraq uh, to do a suicide attack. The first factor is what I call a structural condition of the information revolution age. Today, if you're a Muslim living in Europe, if you're a Muslim living in Indonesia and Morocco and others, because of satellite television, first and foremost, but also the internet, which is less uh, prevalent than the satellite television, because of those things, the images of Muslim suffering, the images of the shock and awe phase, images of Abu Ghraib, of Guantanamo, and of the sense of the, even the Palestinian context, which doesn't directly relate to Iraq, but many, many Muslims in their mind have related it to Iraq. Because of those images, the personal suffering of Muslims have been brought to your home, in front of you. You cannot escape it. 
And so what I argue is that this condition of the information age, satellite and the internet, is it really created the kind of imagined community that uh, uh, people have written about with regards to European nationalism with the printed press. The printed press creating the sense of national community among disparate individuals and communities that they never see each other, they never met each other, yet there's a sense of identification with that. That is important because you cannot, even here when I sit in, in America, in Kansas, I live in Kansas, I have Al Jazeera and I'll have Al Arabiya and these satellite channels and I watch images of Israelis fighting the Lebanese in the last uh, war, seeing images of children dying, even as an American who's secular, well integrated and quite happy to be in America, I feel a sense of, uh, of, of connection with the suffering of Muslims in Lebanon. And I can't help but feel that that has, at least in part, contributed to identification with suffering in Iraq and hence the need to volunteer there. Secondly, the war in Iraq really took place in the context of intensified Muslim grievances against the U.S. I mean, if you go back to 2003 and remember what was going on, there was the Palestinian Al-Aqsa uprising, which really drove a lot of Muslims around the world nuts, particularly in the Arab world and the adjacent countries. But even as far as Morocco and Indonesia, you had mass demonstrations in support of the Palestinians. And there was the war on terrorism, which this is something perhaps we could talk about, but in the minds of many Muslims, the war on terrorism was, is a war on Islam. That the war on terrorism only targets Islamic movements and Muslims. It doesn't go target the Colombian FARC or the IRA or whatever uh, uh, terrorist groups are out there. And so people have really bought into this notion that the war on terrorism is a war on Islam. We could get into the reasons of why that is. Part of it is driven by conspiratorial view that 9-11 wasn't really done by the Muslims and that it was the Mossad or even the CIA that did it because they wanted to go on this new empire, uh, this, you know, this new imperial adventure. But nonetheless, the, in their minds, in their perception, this is a war on, uh, on Islam. Thirdly, there's a history of, by the time Iraq, the war on Iraq broke out, there was a history and a template of volunteering to other conflicts. So for many of the jihadists, there was the experience of Afghanistan, volunteering to go help fight the, Af uh, help the Afghan Mujahideen fight the Soviets. There was Bosnia, there was Chechnya, there was Kosovo, and there was for some Somalia and others. And so that created a template whereby a conflict happens, we know what to do, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We begin to mobilize the networks, we begin to put the literature out, we, we have the narrative. There's a conflict, Muslims are suffering, we need to go. And this is a classical jihad for many of these individuals. And indeed, if uh, this is a classical defensive jihad. Iraq was attacked, it never attacked America. It was, uh, and uh, Saddam Hussein appeared to be complying with everything that was being thrown his way, and yet the invasion took place. And to many people, this was a defensive jihad, and the template of volunteering was already there. But perhaps more important than the template is that there were existing radical networks, and we cannot underestimate this. So if you've talked about, uh, you know, I've talked so far about four factors. If those four factors by themselves are not enough to get people to volunteer to Iraq, you needed to have networks, individuals who had the, know, uh, the ways and means of jihad, of mobilizing people, of getting people from one place to another, of connecting them and giving them the credibility to be accepted as an insurgent or as a suicide bomber in Iraq. And these networks have been developing since the late 80s, but particularly during the 1990s, initially with the Afghan camps, but some camps that were developed later in Bosnia and Chechnya and others. These individuals, in the context of the war on terrorism, they were being driven out of Afghanistan the security was tightening in Europe. The security was also tightening in the Middle East because of pressure on the, from the U.S. on the Yemenis, the Saudis, and others to tighten on these radical Islamists. Well, that security environment combined with the pre-existing networks really made it easier. I mean, it was a no-brainer that Americans are in Iraq. Let's, uh, let's go there. Um, and the final factor here I want to point to is that the war in uh, Iraq, I Iraq was in the heart of the Muslim world. It wasn't in a distance, dis in, the, in the Arab Muslim world. And the jihadi movement we know tends to be a more Arab movement rather than a Pakistani or Indonesian or others. Although most Muslims around the world are not Arabs. Um, Iraq was in the heart of the Muslim world. It's, uh, it's you know, where the Abbasid Empire was. 
It has six uh, borders, so it's, uh, it's not too difficult to penetrate, and particularly with the collapse of the security and the, and the Ba'athist and the, and the Iraqi army disbanded. So th the fact that it was near and people knew about Baghdad, you know, if you looked about, if you talk to Muslims about Bosnia, a lot of Muslims, including myself, I didn't know about Bosnia until I began to see images of Bosnia. And same thing with Chechnya. Many Muslims don't know about Chechnya. But Muslims know about Iraq. They don't know about Baghdad. And that centrality of that was very important for the narrative of al-Qaeda, that this is a defensive jihad to save the former empire, the Abbasid empire, just as it was invaded by the Crusaders before or the Tartars before. Uh, now it is by the new crusade uh, with the US. And so I think these factors help set the conditions of, of uh, volunteerism. But one thing that we still don't know is, well, OK, it's one thing to volunteer, but another thing, why do you then do you engage in suicide attacks? And this is what, uh, the sixth factor that I, uh, I want to talk about. And that is, the jihadists did a very good job of exploiting the culture of martyrdom that was already developed in the Muslim world with regards to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Again, go back to 2003, which hopefully it's not too hard for many of us now. Uh, 2003, the Palestinian uprising was going on. The Palestinians were sending suicide bombers against Israelis, including Israeli civilians. And what did the Arabs do and the, and the Muslim scholars do? They venerated the martyrs. They considered them heroic. They didn't say this was uh, suicide. They called it martyrdom operations. They didn't say that this was illegitimate jihad. They said this is the highest form of jihad. These martyrs weren't just dying. These martyrs were going to the highest paradise, where they are uh, uh, greeted by other martyrs, saints, and prophets. They have all their sins wiped out. And that they are, uh, and they could even intercede on the part of their families with God to let them into heaven. So the whole culture of martyrdom that was uh, done initially to support the Lebanese uh, resistance, Hezbollah, and later the Palestinians, was exploited by the jihadists to say, how is Iraq different from Palestine or Lebanon? In Iraq, you have um, an occupation by non-Muslims. In Iraq, you have an unjust invasion. Um, just as, in the same, uh, just as uh, you have in Palestine, Lebanon, and elsewhere. Why is it legitimate to go fight there, but not in Iraq? Why is it legitimate to carry suicide attacks there, but not in Iraq? And to many governments, and uh, there was no clear answer to this. And I think those factors help explain this. Let me talk about, and let me know if I'm going on too long, so, but uh, let me talk about a bit about the demographics of the volunteers. I sort of already gave a hint of who they are, but um, from the list of Arab martyrs, individuals that fell in Iraq, uh, that are often published on the webs, and there's certainly a lot of videos that show some of these guys, and also the Al Qaeda in Iraq puts out this thing called um, uh, biographies of imminent martyrs, where every, uh, on a monthly newsletter, where they, emph where they show one of the martyrs, uh, sometimes not necessarily their <laughs> image, but they tell a story about how they got there and what they did and all that. From collecting that information, the demographics we get is that volunteers mainly come from Saudi Arabia, but there are at least 19 or 20 nationalities represented in Iraq. So, Saudi Arabia tends to be a bigger chunk of the, uh, of the volunteers, but there's still about 19 nationalities represented. Um, volunteers are mainly men in their early to late 20s. And this is important because early 20s suggests that this might be new radicalization, novices that ha don't have experiences in jihad. Uh, that uh, gone. If you're in your late 20s, there is a possibility that you may have been to Afghanistan, been to Chechnya and others. But if you're in your late teens and early 20s, chances are that is new volunteerism. And so the war in Iraq radicalized a new generation. Well, this shouldn't be a, a surprising to us now, but uh, perhaps when I wrote the book, it may have been a, a revelation. Um, but there are really no salient patterns in terms of socioeconomic status. You have rich and poor, middle class educational levels. We have a story of a guy who was studying to be a doctor in Sudan and decided he took his money and decided to go to Iraq and ultimately became a suicide bomber. No clear tribal affiliations, uh, you know, un so they don't come from a particular tribal area or, or a underprivileged area in any part of the Muslim world. It really is across the board. The fact that many Saudis are there, they tend to come mainly from Riyadh. So this, in Saudi Arabia, this is, the, the, you know, the center, certainly an urban area. So tribal affiliations are rather weak. Um, 
And interestingly, as I mentioned earlier, on Thanksgiving Day, New York Times had an article uh, entitled Foreign Fighters in Iraq Tied to U.S. Allies. And it talked about an incursion into uh, uh, camps that were run by, um, uh, by uh, smugglers. And they found all these documents, about 700 documents, of foreign fighters who actually had to write you know, their names and their place, and uh, as, as I guess they were put into the pipeline of insurgent activities. Of those 700 fighters, 305 came from Saudi Arabia, so that's somewhere in the 40th percentile. Uh, 137 came from Libya, which was surprising to me because on, on my data I have few Libyans, but they don't really figure that prominently. But in that list, Libya was quite big. Algeria, I think, was next. Uh, actually, Yemen, Algeria, Morocco, two from France, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, etc. And so you get a lot from Arab countries. Inter interestingly, you don't get any from Iran. Um, uh, well, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So. Uh, it w uh, so the, the, the recent data seems to suggest that we're still getting a lot of foreign fighters, although the numbers have really dwindled. And uh, again, it confirms sort of my data with regards to the Saudis being a dominant group. The next thing I want to move into is what are the motivations of these? And this is really difficult. And this is where I, I would say to you that it, my analysis is, is somewhat speculative because it is based on unreliable data. Uh, but nonetheless, when we go through this carefully, I've gone through 405 biographies to try to sort of see hints of what the potentially could have motivated them. What I do is I break these into kind of three categories, um, increasingly four. Um, the first category is what I call true believers. These are individuals that have a few, uh, that are fugitive jihadists, that are jihadists who are either wanted by their governments, uh, known to be on a terrorist list somewhere, or that have, have had experiences in fighting in Chechnya, Bosnia, in Afghanistan, or were to the Afghan training camps uh, of Al Qaeda in the 1990s. And these guys were either seeking a new haven or seeking a new opportunity uh, to extend their militant career. So we do see a lot of individuals that have prior experience going to Iraq. And you could tell in their biographies, say, this brother fought in Chechnya. He went back to Kuwait and was arrested. But ultimately, he got out, and he went to the first battle of Fallujah and all that. So sometimes these biographies do have details that are uh, suggestive. I don't in any way try to break it down into it's mainly true believers or mainly some other category, because really the data is not reliable and doesn't allow us to do that. The second, uh, interestingly about the true believers is that oftentimes when they are killed, they, are, they don't die in suicide attacks, but they are killed either by a bombing or um, you know, they were carrying out a conventional attack and they die. And what that tells me is that organizations often select those with experience and skills, they are not sent to become suicide bombers. And even in some of the biographies, they say this brother wanted to be a suicide bomber. Well, they don't use suicide bomber. This brother wanted to, he was begging to be, do a martyrdom operation. But uh, the, 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 or, you know, the, uh, we, he was very good at uh, you know, the internet and all that. And so we decided not to send him uh, to do that. But ultimately, God granted his wish, and he died a martyr in Iraq. So the first category of true believers. The second one is what could be called enraged idealists. These are the individuals who, are, who volunteer themselves, um, who don't necessarily have experience in jihad, but because of images of Muslim suffering, because of the sense that I'm doing it for uh, God and country, particularly this notion of defense of jihad, have volunteered. Um, and we have a lot of stories of bottom-up volunteerism. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, but they often take place in the context of small groups. So it's not just an individual who makes a decision and goes. It's oftentimes it's done in, in the context of small groups. By the way, um, uh, there was a recent article in the New York Times, uh, a lengthy one in the Sunday magazine uh, by Andrea Elliott uh, on a, a small Moroccan town that produces jihadis, some that carried out the Madrid attack, but some ended up going to Iraq. Uh, Tetuan in Morocco. And, and it, it's really wonderful in the sense that it shows you how this bottom-up volunteerism can take place. It's not just an individual making, it's often small group dynamics discussions that could be sort of nurtured by someone from the outside, but oftentimes it's, this, uh, it's, it's more of the discussions that take place. Uh, 
The third category uh, also addressed in Andrea Elliott's uh, uh, article is what could be called born-again Muslims or reformed sinners. These are individuals that are actually recruited top-down, individuals who were um, uh, leading a life of uh, just secular Muslims, oftentimes leading a life on the margins of society into criminality, petty thievery, or even into, you know, uh, into big crime. Um, that at a certain point they see the light, they become um, uh, born-again Muslims or reformed Muslims, uh, fundamentalists, and there's a sense that they feel tremendous amount of guilt about what they did in their past and they're, they're eager to make up for it. They're in seeking instant redemption, if you will. Uh, I often use the story of Malcolm X to sort of relate it to American audiences. If you think of the story of Malcolm X, this guy who <coughs> led a life of petty criminality, wasn't uh, very uh, proud to be an African American, uh, went to jail and in jail he found Islam, uh, particularly by the nation of Islam, and he was nurtured and, uh, and took that zeal, that energy that he, uh, from a past life, and really redirected it in a new way. A fourth category that is emerging is that of the Avengers, and these are the individuals who are increasingly Iraqi. They are doing this because of the sectarian nature of the conflict that has emerged since 2006. And uh, so just a couple of days ago, I think there was an attack by a woman in Bakuba. Uh, I, I don't know. I think she's an Iraqi. Generally speaking, they tend to be, if they're women, they tend to be Iraqis. But uh, uh, we know that the number of Iraqis has been increasing in the ranks of suicide bombers. And uh, a lot of the attacks, I believe, have to deal with this idea of taking revenge on the Shiite militias and the Shiite, as they would say, Shiite government uh, in Iraq. Um, let me talk about, uh, I guess, a few more minutes about the patterns in all the th three or four patterns, that, oh, particularly the three patterns, the first three patterns. I already mentioned small group dynamics, and this cannot be underestimated. Rarely do you find individuals going on their own. It's usually in small groups. Um, and insurgent videos often reveal that they are training in small groups. The send-off involves a group dynamic of individuals all hugging and bidding the person goodbye and, uh, and all that, and the person's usually smiling and happy to be driving off in his explosive latent car. Um, so this tells me that this, there's something about a group commitment that reinforces the initial decision to go to Iraq or perhaps to become a suicide bomber. This is not just simply in the minds of an individual. Uh, the other thing that comes salient in all these stories is that recruits rarely tell their families. Over and over, the families are surprised. We're, we didn't know he told us he was going to go do the small pilgrimage in Mecca, the Umrah, or he said he was going to go get a job uh, in, the, in Dubai, or he was doing this or that. And the next thing we know, we get a call that he is in Iraq, um, uh, deciding to join the insurgency there. And the call after that that they get is usually from an Iraqi or someone else that says to them, congratulations, your son has been martyred. That means, you know, th this is a high aspiration to be a martyr in Islam, and so rather than mourn, you should be congratulated. And, and so what groups do once you make it to Iraq is they really try to cut off your ties to the external wor world to prevent countervailing influences on your decision to be, uh, to be in Iraq. Let me conclude by making some implications for the U.S. And also I want to talk about this issue of the surge and uh, things improving in Iraq because I know it's on the minds of a lot of people. The implications of the analysis that I've presented so far suggest that both in the cases of Iraq and Afghanistan, that substantial military presence actually tends to be attracting, uh, tends to attract suicide bombers, not deter them. So, you know, the effect of the war on Afghanistan and the war on Iraq should have been to decrease suicide attacks. But as I started out by saying, is that we've noticed a six-fold increase. And so what that tells me, uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but it does tell me that, uh, it, that military actions and kinetics, as the military would say, is not necessarily the most effective way to deal with this phenomenon of suicide terrorism. And the more we have a heavy footprint and a strong military presence in an area that tends to attract suicide bo bombers, not deter them. The other thing from my analysis is oftentimes we put the emphasis in Iraq on the convenient enemies of Iran and Syria, but we tend to ignore the sort of dubious ally allies, particularly those that spread an anti-Shia ideology. Um, so the fact that most suicide bombers target the Shiites in Iraq and, and demonization of the Shiite government as being an apostate government loyal to Iran and all that, 
to me, that actually helps contribute and feed the phenomena of suicide bombers, yet we don't really deal with that uh, in the U.S. very well. Um, let me talk a little bit about the surge, and I'll conclude here, and I'm eager to get, take your questions. Um, you know, there's been a lot of articles in, uh, uh, and press reports about numbers declining in Iraq, and I have no reason to doubt that, and I really hope and pray that that is really an enduring trend, that we do indeed, ha or have indeed turned a corner in Iraq and things um, uh, improve. Uh, my sense is I think we shouldn't rush to judge this issue or the situation because we have seen in the past, and I remember getting calls in the past, people saying, have, have we turned a corner after elections or after, you know, or, or even just dips in violence, people said, hey, are, are things improving? And then you see a re-escalation in violence. So I think we should sort of hold our breath a little bit and uh, not rush to judgment. Um, but let me make three points about this recent dip in violence. Um, the first one is that um, off, most reports talk about that the violence has dropped to levels at the early 2006. So this is before the Samara bombing, Samara bombing the, the shrine in February 2006 when all the sectarian killing took place. What I like to remind people is that in 2006 and even in 2005, things weren't that great in Iraq. So to say that the violence has dropped to the levels of 2006 might be an improvement, but it's still not, things aren't as great as uh, we'd like them to be. Uh, secondly, really the, much of the ethnic cleansing or the, or the tahjir, the driving of you know, the Shiites out of the Sunni areas and the Sunnis out of Shia has been completed in Baghdad. I mean, the reports often talk about Sunnis stay in their areas, even though they might have a house in an area that's predominantly Shia, they don't go there, and the Shiites stay in their area. So that is an important factor in contributing to the reduction of violence in the sectarian thing. But perhaps the most important one is this retreat of Al-Qaeda and the increasing misfortunes or, uh, of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Qaeda is in trouble in Iraq. Indeed, the tribes have turned against it. Sunni insurgents are increasingly fighting it, and not just fighting it in terms of, uh, uh, in a subtle way, they're officially saying that we are driving Al-Qaeda out because they have done this and this and, uh, and all that. But the problem is that the, the misfortunes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq are really driven by its own mistakes, not by the surge. I mean, the surge helps. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be the, one of these sort of partisans that just simply says that the surge hasn't helped. But the, bigger th the biggest impact of why Al-Qaeda is in retreat in Iraq is because of its own mistakes. And the biggest mistake it did is that it declared an Islamic State of Iraq in October 2006. What it was trying to do is catapult itself at ahead of the insurgency. Even though Al-Qaeda is, is a small group within the broader insurgency, its attacks are only about 15 percent. And even though Al-Qaeda really has foreign leadership, um, and it, the reason it thrives in Iraq is because the Sunni insurgents and the nationalists have accepted it and given it space. It has catapulted itself in front of the, ins uh, the insurgents saying, we are the leaders of the insurgency. You should follow our political program. And those of you that don't pledge allegiance to ISI, the Islamic State of Iraq, are in violation of the, of the Quran and God, and, and we will treat you, uh, we will battle you. And indeed, Al-Qaeda went around and killed some key commanders of the 1920 Revolution Brigades and later the Islamic Army of Iraq. So it is the missteps of Al-Qaeda that has really turned the insurgents and the tribes against it, not so much the presence of the surge. And uh, ultimately, I think it's what it's, what's going to require is to have a political reconciliation to make this security arrangement or the security developments uh, an enduring trend. And, and, and unless we get that, I think this we might end up in a few months from now talking about the re-escalating violence in Iraq. I think I've given you a lot to think about and hopefully to raise questions and uh, thank you for your audience. Great, thank you very much. Why don't you have a seat? Okay, yeah. good. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Sheikh. Well, that was great. I think you may have given the beginning of an answer to um, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld when he asked in that famous memo, I think it was in 2003, are we, uh, how are we doing, are we, are we producing more um, uh, Al-Qaeda insurgents um, faster than we can capture or kill them? Um, I'd actually love, in the first part of the question, to get a sense of to what extent, um, to what extent, here's what I'm going to do. I was just at a, at a uh, dinner the other night. Um, it was about 
looking at whether or not the UN or some other third party mm -hmm. can have uh, any kind of role in getting some type of political uh, uh, process underway in Iraq. That could do what General Petraeus is saying is, is hey, this is a counterinsurgency. What we need here is a 20 percent effort by the U.S. military and an 80 percent political effort here. Um, mm -hmm. And it, which follows, uh, I think, what you're talking about, which is that, you know, the, the reduction, to the extent there is a reduction in Iraq, is due more to the internal politics of what's going on in Iraq than, than anything that the military can do. And I think General Petraeus is generally in agreed with, agreement with that, and he's taken advantage of that opportunity. Um, but I think what we're starting to see is um, uh, a certain awareness at, at very high levels. Uh, at this dinner party we had um, former um, Bush administration official Carl, Carlos Pascual. Um, we had Lakhdar Brahimi, the previous um, uh, the, the, the previous uh, UN interlocutor in Iraq. Um, Larry Diamond, who mm -hmm. uh, was was serving in Iraq, um, talking about the when's the proper role and, and recognizing that a diplomatic surge is the only way you're going to get anything, and time is running out very fast. At the same time, we've just launched potentially this, this Annapolis conference, um, this process that um, uh, the U.S. Uh, administration is, is claiming will lead to some type of two-state solution for Israel-Palestine. Um, to what extent are those efforts and any other efforts that might come along in, in, in a presumably a new administration in 2009, to what extent can addressing some of these grievances uh, blunt the trend, the dynamic that's happening in the martyrdom, um, in, in, in volunteerism for martyrdom operations. Um, to what extent is this kind of strategic concept of, mm -hmm. hey, let's reduce um, the grievances, let's reduce mm -hmm. the footprint. To what extent will that have um, either a, uh, a calming effect or a knockout blow to this trend? Um, right. and there, I don't think there will be such a thing as a knockout blow to this event. Uh, what I would look at is a kind of a declining uh, uh, support. We are seeing data on declining support for both bin Laden and for uh, suicide attacks. But generally that takes place in societies in which they've been really hurt by suicide bombers. So in Morocco, in Jordan to some extent, uh, and others, Indonesia. Um, and I think, yes, we should definitely work on the other fronts with regards to the, pa the Palestinian-Israeli issue to me is very key uh, because that is often used as a trump card by al-Qaeda and affiliate organizations to say that, look, you know, okay, they say they want to end uh, uh, occupation in Iraq, well, why not in, uh, in Palestine? They say they are for liberty, well, why not liberty there? You know, that kind of a thing. So that's always used by them as a trump card. And it, and it certainly will help. Um, but I think the key thing is the denial of safe havens for these groups because what we notice from the history of the global jihadist movement is that wherever they go, whether it's in Bosnia, Afghanistan, and uh, Chechnya, and, and uh, in Iraq, is they try to set up training camps because they see this as part of a long-term struggle. And the training camps are important not because they're, they're training people in the skills, but it fosters that socialization in the culture of martyrdom. In the training camps, they, you learn about how it, you know, the ultimate aspiration of every Muslim should be to wage jihad and to die in that jihad. And uh, so that socialization is very important. The other thing is it has to come from the Muslim world itself. The scholars, uh, the, the entertainers, the politicians have to stop speaking with a double tongue, where on the one hand, well, it's okay to do suicide attacks in Israel, but not okay in, uh, uh, in Iraq, or it's, it's uh, okay in Chechnya, but not, not in uh, Riyadh. I think because that helps the jihadists exploit that gap to say, well, actually those two conditions are similar. You say Iraq and Palestine are different, but actually they're the same. And having a sort of a clear, unequivocal sort of moral clarity, if you will, on this issue of suicide attacks, targeting civilians, uh, uh, killing yourself is just simply dead wrong in Islam. I, I, I think that is that it will have a, a long-term impact on, the, on that issue. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to the floor. Um, we're in the back, yeah. Um, my, my question is a follow-up on sure. what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, could you identify yourself? Yeah. For Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Quran forbids suicide. Mm -hmm. 
And the most credible theological leaders, like Tara Dowie, mm -hmm. they do the waffling that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Sure. Um, have you, is there any sign of other credible religious leaders who are not affiliated with the government, because they don't have any credible right. leaders, um, you know, getting the ball rolling on a you know, theological argument Uh, great question, um, and I think, uh, th let me start out by making one key point, and I think you made it, that the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet clearly make it, uh, I mean, this is called muhkamat, these are unequivocal verses, that you cannot kill yourself, you cannot kill civilians, and you cannot kill fellow Muslims. Yet in Iraq, and Afghanistan, uh, and Pakistan increasingly, you're killing yourself, you're killing civilians, and you're killing fellow Muslims. That should be the mantra of the U.S. and anyone who's doing a you know, strategic communication campaign against these guys. But to your point about credible scholars that don't wa you know, waffle on this issue, what I would say is there are, and one of the best ones is a radical Salafi himself, is Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi, who was the mentor of Zarqawi. He wrote uh, a, a letter of advice to Zarqawi when he was alive, and, he, and subsequently wrote this thing on kind of reflections on the jihad. And he says that, look, what the jihadists have done is they've taken an exceptional tactic, a tactic that should be used in rare exceptions, and turned it into the, the rule. And he goes into theological arguments about how you should protect Muslim lives and treat them as the, the, the dearest thing, how you shouldn't engage in attacks that even if marginally they could t hurt Muslims, you shouldn't do it. And he says the rule is, it, you know, unless there's no other way to fight and unless there is, you know, th this is a pressing operation that has to take place, that you should do it. So they have come, they've come up with arguments against them. Another leader is Abu Basir Tartusi, who was based in London, I think he still is. Uh, he's a radical Salafi. I mean, this guy advocates jihad and all that. And he says suicide bombings are suicide. And he goes through the arguments of the radicals and, and points them out. Um, so they are out there. Um, the problem is, you know, it's always uh, uh, an issue of, okay, if you, if you say listen to Abu Muhammad al maqdisi what he's saying on this issue, well, why not listen to him what he says on other issues which are rather uh, problematic for us? Um, but the best that Muslim scholars that are in somewhat in the middle, like Qaradawi, who has tremendous legitimacy, very popular, is you'll get as, it's okay in Israel, but not okay in Iraq. It's okay here, but not in Saudi Arabia. Or China. And I think that still leaves the door open for the jihadists to walk in. By the way, in my book, I spent an entire chapter on how jihadists justify suicide bombings, the theological arguments they make. And they're quite astute ones, but they're still, you can still punch holes in them. I'm going to make two shameless plugs. We're selling the book in the back <laughs> after this session. I get no so royalties for Please go party, ahead so. and purchase, pick one up. And then the other thing is... Mohammed has been a little bit, um, uh, a little bit modest. Um, the article, the recent article in the New York Times Magazine, um, uh, talking about the uh, the village in Morocco, Tetuan. Um, he was a, a major uh, consultant on the article as well. So, um, uh, more but my name wasn't cited in there. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, okay, next. Uh, Michael Marsh with UPI. Um, when you set out the, the sort of six factors uh -huh. that, that radicalize. All over the world. The first three or four were to do with um, a lot to do with the United States. You know, the war on terror, killing, mm -hmm. war on Islam, um, images of uh, you know, suffering of, of, of Muslims mm -hmm. at the hands of the U.S. in Iraq or sure. the U.S. Et cetera, et cetera. But how does that match the fact that the targets of the suicide attacks in, in Iraq are, are not U.S. forces? Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, uh, Iraqi police and, and, and Shiites. No, this seems to be a, a Absolutely. Yeah. No, this is great. Great question. Uh, I say it's great because I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the answer is what the jihadists have done is they've said, look, the Americans cannot rule in Iraq. They cannot succeed in Iraq if they do not have proxies, what they call apostates or collaborators. And, and Zarqawi has this line that says, why is it okay uh, to kill our enemy if he has blonde hair and blue eyes, but not kill him if he has dark hair and black eyes. 
And what he was saying is that, look, the Iraqi army and the security forces are working as, I mean, he uses really derogatory term, as the dogs uh, for their masters. They're doing the dirty work for the Americans, just as the Northern Alliance did the dirty work of the Americans in Afghanistan. And he says there really there are no difference between them. And that argument actually does resonate to some extent because uh, there's, again, with the Palestinian experience, you have a lot of people saying, you know, anyone who collaborates with the Israelis should be killed. And, you know, the Palestinians cheer that. Or in Lebanon, anyone who collaborates against Hezbollah with the Israelis, they're executed and people don't have a problem with that. And that's how he sort of gets around that issue. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I wanted to pick up on, on that. Um, when we're looking at, um, as, as when we were talking in preparation for this, um, in Steve Cole, our president's book, uh, Ghost Wars, he talks about the Pakistani, uh, the uh, Afghani population not being able to produce suicide bombers um, at the beginning, um, uh, but that they had to import them. Um, now we're starting to see, you were just talking about the um, rejection of al-Qaeda as the leadership element uh, in the insurgent forces in Iraq. Um, and it's a, again, it's a foreign-led mm -hmm. element. Um, to what extent um, is this, uh, is, is al-Qaeda stumbling? Is it overusing this tactic? You're talking about um, getting out ahead of some of these scholars, including Zarqawi's uh, mentor. Um, where, what's, what's happening, uh, I think, with, with the use of this tactic? Are they actually over, starting to overuse it? Uh, some people have made the claim that part of the, the, the rebellion of the tribes against al-Qaeda or even the sur insurgents against al-Qaeda is because they have just too bloody. And I don't buy that. I mean, al-Qaeda from the beginning was bloody. And these insurgents were with it from 2004, 2005. Even when Zarqawi died, most of the insurgent groups uh, issued uh, communiques, you know, condoning and congratulating, actually, the, the, the martyrdom of Zarqawi and all that. Uh, congratulating in a, in, a, in a positive sense for Zarqawi that he's a martyr. Um, I think what al-Qaeda has going for it is this plausible deniability where they carry out attacks against civilians, but they never, I've never seen a video of an attack against civilians. You'll see attacks against uh, Iraqi security forces, against uh, police, and against Americans, but never against civilians. And they don't, and uh, even claims of responsibility against attacks against civilians are rarely made. And that leaves the room open for people to say, well, these are really the Mossad or the, the, the CIA that are behind these. And you hear Iraqis say this. Iraqis, Jordanians I've interviewed, they would tell me, the suicide bombings, it's not the, it's not, uh, the insurgents. And they don't really distinguish al-Qaeda from the insurgents. It's, uh, it's the Americans. They want the, the Sunnis and Shiites to fight each other so they don't kill Americans. Um, so I'm not sure they're overplaying that tactic because really their goal in, in Iraq is to create sectarian tension. Uh, their goal in Pakistan and in Afghanistan now is to try to collapse the regime to make it a burden uh, on them to be able to rule all of Afghanistan. And in Pakistan, they're char in ch challenging the military. Um, now that I think that might be a problem there for them in Pakistan because that might get the military to really crack down hard on them. But uh, in other areas, I don't think so. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, sir. Um, Clay Ramsey, Program on Internet yeah. Policy. Mm. Uh, I, I want to, my question really is to keep you talking about this, this I think, really key element of the, the ethical prohibition that most people around the world feel about uh, attacks intentionally targeted uh, mm -hmm. on civilians. Uh, and um, so for instance, uh, Chris Fair, who's come back from four months in Afghanistan, she, what she was seeing in that case is that uh, uh, the Taliban were going, going to some lengths to, um, in fact, organize the attack so they were supposed to uh, at least hit the national police, but, mm -hmm. but not hit civilians. Though in practice, mm -hmm. three quarters or more of their victims were civilians. Mm -hmm. um, in the Palestinian case, um, you have heard four more times than mm -hmm. I uh, the, the argument made that, well, every Israeli is really a soldier mm -hmm. anyway. They're, everybody's got, they've got a uniform in the closet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't really matter what they look like. Um, so what is the Iraqi version of this? Um, is there a, 
since they are, since Al Qaeda in Iraq is unwilling to claim that responsibility for attacks on civilians, what's their range? How far do mm -hmm. they go? How, how do they evade this? Sure. Um, well, now I have to get into some theology. I <laughs> put on my, my Islamic rope and here. Uh, they make several religious arguments, I mean, arguments that presumably are religious. One, they say that in the Quran, it says that if you take your turn, fight them in the manner that they fight you. And so if you choose to fight, then it is permissible to, for you to fight them, and this is a principle of reciprocity, to fight them in the way that they fight you. And since the Americans use indiscriminate tactics, killing, bombing, uh, and all that, and they kill civilians, and the Shiites, because they engage in what's called qatl ala al-hawiyya, killing based on identity, so indiscriminate killing of Sunnis just because they're Sunnis, it is OK to kill them in turn in the way that they kill us um, uh, until they stop. Once they stop, then we could, yes, the prohibition against killing civilians applies. So that's one argument they make. The other argument they make is this is very ingenious. Why they, I don't know how they dug it up. from, But in Islamic history, there is the scholars debated this issue. Is it permissible to kill Muslims who are serving as human shields for the enemy? So an invading army comes and gathers up a bunch of Muslims and puts them in front so that if, you, if, the, other, if the Muslims fight, the, Muslim, you know, they, the sh human shields are killed. And the scholars ruled it is permissible. But they put very stringent conditions on this that the jihadists ignore. The one condition they say is there can be no other way to fight the invaders. Number two, that if you don't fight the invaders, there would be a greater harm to Muslims. That is, you know, okay, you, you don't want to kill these human shields, but then all of Muslims would be subject to, you know, annihilation if you don't do that. Thirdly, that when you attack the other side, you're not targeting the Muslims, you're targeting the other side, but it just happens that the Muslims will get hurt. And so they use that argument to be able to make, to say that it is permissible <coughs> to kill fellow Muslims who are in Iraq. The Shiites, they say, in general, are serving as human shields for the Americans, whether intentionally by joining the police and all that, or unintentionally just because the, the Americans are in their areas. And, and they even use the argument of political shield and all that. Um, and then they take the argument further and say, well, if it is OK to kill Muslims to fight the enemy, at Muslim civilians who are innocent, and we know they're innocent, to fight the enemy, then certainly it's OK to kill non-Muslims to fight the enemy, and hence the, the attacks against civilians in the US. So these are some of the theological arguments. But they never abandon the Quranic principle and the prophetic principle of not targeting civilians. But they say there are all sorts of exceptions to this. Now, going back to that gentleman I was mentioning, uh, Abu Muhammad al-Maqdisi, who the mentor of Zarqawi, he has counter responses to all those. And, and he brings all the exceptions. He says, first of all, this is an exception. So it should be an exceptional policy, not the rule, which you've turned it into a rule. And secondly, uh, you have to know there are other prophetic traditions. So for instance, there's a Quranic verse that says, and the Quran sort of trumps everything, that says to the Muslims that I would have sent you as armies to go fight the unbelievers in Mecca. But I know that there are believers in Mecca, and they would be hurt. So I held you back, even though, really, I, I would have preferred to send you. This is a Quranic verse. They don't talk about that. And there's, so they're kind of susceptible to this counter-argumentation. Interesting. Sir. Uh, Phil Smucker, author of mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda's Great Escape. Um, you, you gave us your first uh, in the six, list mm -hmm. of six motivating factors for uh, this rapid volunteerism, uh, most of whom are foreign fighters people on the outside, and you, you, you said these were images and ideas, and you, 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 you cited Abu Ghraib, and you, mm -hmm. you cited Guantanamo. Could you break that down a little bit further in terms of media generated by their propaganda machine versus the international media, the Arab media, the American media? Um, and if you took that away, I, I, I would wonder, if you really took that first factor away, how much of a drastic drop you would have, after all. I mean, if you took eliminated that factor entirely, the media and the propaganda machine, how much w of this would just vanish anyway? That's sure. My, my well, I think it, a lot of it would go away, because I really believe that what's mobilizing people behind Al-Qaeda, it's not the Al-Qaeda ideology, which is really meant, most people think is, uh, is a nutty ideology. This notion of takfir, hakamiyat, all these grand ideologies, I don't think that's what's mobilizing people. I think it is the political claims, 
again, Palestine, war on terrorism, Iraq, sanctions, support uh, for Israel in Lebanon, all, all the other stuff, number one. Number two, it's the emotional claims, the stories of women being uh, abused and mistreated in Iraq and other places. Uh, and, and, you know, again, not to shamelessly plug my stuff, but in, the ch in a book I write a whole chapter on the mythology of martyrdom and, and how the images, how suicide terrorism is framed. <coughs> and the way they frame it is they begin with this narrative of humiliation, that Muslims are humiliated. But this is not in an abstract sense. They'll show you little children being killed. They'll show you mosques being destroyed. They'll show you women who are alleged and cry. And this was all in their videos, women crying. The Iraqi police came and they took us and they handed us to the Americans because they were looking for our husbands. And then, you know, the uh, uh, tones and even sometimes explicit claims that we've been raped by the Americans. So humiliation is the first condition. Second condition is our leaders don't do anything about this. King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, uh, well, I'm sorry, King Abdullah now, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah of Jordan, Mubarak, uh, the Iraqi government, they don't do anything to protect these people. So the third part of the narrative is you as an individual have to step forward and fight. And if you do, you will succeed. It's not that you might succeed, you will succeed. You will humiliate them and you will regain the glory of Islam and all that. So they do that and you see in their videos they explicitly talk about this. But this is not just in the videos. This is what you also see reported in Al Jazeera, Al Manar, even Al Arabiya, and some of the ones that are less sort of antagonistic to the US. So if you remove the propaganda from the internet and from their publications, you still have the images of the shock and awe phase, uh, images of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo that are from satellite television. So I'm not sure you could begin with the premise of removing that. And how strong is the, how strong is the propaganda machine? Is it is it getting stronger or is it weakening? Or? I don't think it's They're weakening. Wrong. It's very strong. They're, it's very well branded. So the videos come out on a regular basis. I get, uh, I have connect, uh, uh, <coughs> subscriptions with some of these, but also I watch them on my side on the jihadi forums. Videos every day. They're often branded with Al Qaeda brand from a, a Fajr media center, a Sahab media center that comes out of Afghanistan. And, uh, and they're translated in foreign languages. So this is a media production that's strong. I, okay, it's not CNN or Fox or things like that, but it is certainly uh, very good and enough to get your uh, agitated. Okay, I think it's sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for really informative, mm -hmm. really good analysis. Uh, and could you name, identify yourself, sir? Uh, as my name is Mohammed Borghi. I'm from Australia University. Mm -hmm. My question is that you mentioned about the suicide all from the point of the poverty in the way they want to show something. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't you go, although you touch to some extent, one step back, it's not from desperation, uh, from losing the trust to any world opinion, any institution, and they think they cannot be here anyway. Uh, let me start with that for George Hubbard was a communist mm -hmm. country. In Munich, you remember that they were told him that what he did, it was against the politically damaged mm -hmm. us and world, we do the world opinion. I said, what the hell world opinion? What does it work? Mm -hmm. We get so many condemnation from the UN, what does it work for us? Mm -hmm. We just go and down there, condemn Israel, and it doesn't mm -hmm. work anything. So during the years, that they lost the trust of any negotiation, any public opinion, any institution, any place that had any use to be here. Mm -hmm. Since it was like that, so they started up a desperation to do something about that. Then Islam get involved mm -hmm. because it was easier that mobilize people by the religion. Mm -hmm. And from there on, they started to build up all kind of the Salafis and all of the kind of the justification, but well, I, I, I got yeah, I got there. the point. I, I think that's a very good question, and I, I agree. I think with the thrust of what you're saying. One thing I would caution is I don't want to sort of have a reductionist theory that all of this is due to desperation or loss of trust in the UN and world opinion or their own governments. What I would say is that is an important factor. It's why I would list it. I'm, I'm, I'm big on just lots of, <laughs> throwing lots of factors and see what stays, right? 
uh, it's not the most attractive sort of scientific view of the world, but nonetheless, I, 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 I'll never, I'll just leave it there. But I think what, what you're pointing to is that a lot of people feel that no one is there to defend them. One thing that you hear is that our governments don't do anything, and they're either impotent, which is a very powerful uh, thing to say in the, in the Arab mind at least, or else they are collaborators. So, you know, you have the Arab League prior to the invasion of Iraq making all these condemnations, but then they fight with each other, and then Qatar has CENTCOM there, Bahrain has the naval base, or, you know, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and all these countries, Kuwait allowing troops to go in from its territory. The sense of that there's an injustice and no one is there to defend us creates a, a demand. And when there is a demand, there will be people who supply it. There is a demand for resistance. And that is something that you hear. But there's also mimicry. What is happening is you hear Europeans start, and you, you, you hear them, the, the jihadists, European uh, jihadists in Europe, saying, look, if America could have a coalition of Britain, Spain, uh, Poland, Australia, and all these guys go to invade Iraq, why can't we Muslims, Tunisian, Saudi, Kuwaiti, Jordanian, all this, also unite and go to Iraq to defend it? So there's a kind of mimicry that takes place. So uh, yes, the aspiration that no one is defending us is important, but I wouldn't reduce it all to that. I think there's more there. I want to pick up on that again. Um, again, let's live in a little bit of a hypothetical. Let's say that we do, we are able to, um, inshallah, get a, a, a two-state solution for, for Israel-Palestine. And we get to some type of viable, workable political reconciliation for Iraq. And we start dealing with the energy dependence that's mm -hmm. creating a lot of the, the, the tragic dynamics in the relationship with the Arab world. What's going to happen to this movement? Is it going to turn against the domestic injustices? Um, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to this? If, if you're saying it, we, we're st at some point we're going to have to deal with the, right. the training training camps, they exist within these very loosely um, mm -hmm. controlled states um, that are uh, not very well organized. And sometimes, and many times, uh, uh, tyrannical to use a, uh, the first word that comes to my mind. What's going to happen to this movement? Is it going to turn yeah, I, the again, jihad I, inward? I, I, I got the point. I think I'm not. I, I don't want to make the claim that you know, as many Arab, my many Arab friends would make that you know, if Israel wasn't there, if America supported, didn't support Israel, then all this would go away. No, that's not mm -hmm. the struggle. Uh, that's going on right now is an intra-civilizational struggle. This is dealing with a crisis of Islam in the modern world, a, a civilization that has been in decline and, you know, only second to sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, economic and other measures of progress and civilization. And the crisis is you have secularists that have, want to do it their way, you have Islamic fundamentalists who want to do it their way, and there are other strands, the Islamic modernists that want to kind of go back to an authentic Islamic tradition uh, but at the same time be comfortable with modernity. And that struggle is taking place, and Al-Qaeda is an outcome of that struggle. Mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda is uh, pursuing a particular strategy. You hit the Americans so that America doesn't support the secularists, and then we'll, we'll deal with our own uh, house, or we'll put our house together. Uh, so no, dealing with Israel and resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, which should be done in its own right, is not going to resolve this. But it is going to deprive them of an important card, a drawing card. You know, as you deal with whether it's a military, intelligence, or just in the public policy, this is about, you know, having an argument that, against them and have, depriving them of some of their power. Um, I'm sure they'll find something else, but the Palestinian-Israeli conflict really resonates in many areas. Uh, but there's Kashmir, there's Chechnya, there's others. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, uh, Gary Mitchell for the Mitchell Report. I want to ask a very narrow question, mm -hmm. but it's one that intrigues me, and, uh, uh, and that is a, a question about vocabulary. Mm -hmm. uh, the use of the word or the term jihad or jihadis. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in lots of rooms in the last few years where uh, Muslims have said that our use of that term is in, inappropriate, mm -hmm. inaccurate, etc. What, what's, what's your view on that? And how significant is that, and is there are there options? Right. No, I, I agree, and uh, um, it is a problem. 
because as I started out by saying, many Muslims view the war on terrorism as a war on Islam. So to be concrete, because you asked a concrete question, is I would say we get rid of the phrase war on terrorism. I'm proposing uh, alliance against extremism, because one, alliance implies that we're doing things with others. We're not proposing a, a unilateral policy. Secondly, we're dealing with extremism, which is a front end problem, not terrorism, which is on the back end. Uh, so I'm going with that. But really, we need to take a page from some of the, how Arabs and Muslims deal with this problem, although they do bad things. They, well, one thing they do is they don't say that this is Islamic terrorism, Islamo-fascism, or jihadism. They call them al-fi'al uh, al which means something about uh, an obscure, or I don't know how one would translate, but essentially the uh, kind of these, uh, um, almost like evildoers, although I don't like that either. Um, they refer to them al mugharrar bihim, which means that they have been a manipulated youth, uh, sometimes criminals, extremists. Another term that they use, although that won't work in an American context or European context, is al khawarij So referring to them al khawarij al-Judud, which means the new Kharijites. Kharijites, these are, this is old sect in first, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the first phase of Islam that emerged and they said anyone who doesn't rule by what God laid down is an infidel and we kill him. And the classical tradition just simply said the Khawarij are a bunch of nuts, they're outside of Islam, uh, they're no good. And that's what they're using uh, against them. But what I would go back is I would say let's use the term extremists, we are fighting against extremists and uh, don't use Islamic terrorism and war on terrorism. I'm Pete Chutley from Brookings, mm -hmm. and could you please focus a little bit in the chronology of a, a particular suicide episode on one time that I'm intrigued by. When a potential suicide bomber, let's say, walks into an office to volunteer or something mm -hmm. like that, my question is, do they you know, screen the person? I, I assume this is extremely hard to get information. Right. But but how many change their mind? How many are sort of forced to continue but no longer want to? You hear these stories of suicide bombers uh, chained to steering wheels. Somebody else explodes it against their will, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. How many are sort of kept at this uh, without thinking it, et cetera, et cetera? OK, uh, this is a great question. Uh, again, it's great because I have an answer. <laughs> uh, the, the, but no, uh, it's intrinsically a good question. Uh, the, the, what I would say is the, the theories about being handcuffed and you know your hands are taped to this thing and, and someone detonates from far, it might happen, but I would say these are probably more exceptions than the rule. Because the fact is we see a lot of videos of the jihadists smiling, happy, waving goodbye, as they're, and they're driving. Actually, there's a car driving with a bomb, and the guy's driving next to them waving, and then they just wait behind a little bit, and they blow themselves up. So, and the jihadists do this knowingly because they want to debunk those theories that they're handling. Having said that, I think it's also this notion of complete free will that you're doing this without any sort of, that's why I emphasize the group dynamics. I think that is more, it's more of a subtle manipulation and a subtle pressure than it is we put a gun to your head and you go do it. And I talk a little bit about this notion of encapsulation and bridge burning. Just think about it. If you go make your way to Iraq, you have to go through Syria. When you go through Syria, you don't just travel through our borders. You have to go from a, to a smuggler who takes you from one safe house to another. That safe house then takes you to a safe house in Iraq. You have to have a name of a person who could vouch for you. And I said, usually you go in a small group. A lot of the guys go not wanting necessarily to be suicide bombers. They want to join the jihad. But once they're there, they are in the context of other people who are said, you are, you know, who wants to sign up for martyrdom operations? And people write on the wall. Well, when you see others doing it, it's hard for you to say, well, you know what? I don't really want to do this. Even if you change your mind, how does that work? How, uh, you know, guys, I want to go back. Well, you know, you paid smugglers to take you there. Now you're privy to our information. So they might want to sit with you and say, look, I know it's natural to want to live, but then they'll show you the videos, and they'll show you this, and they'll show you that. I think it is much more subtle, um, uh, that kind of encapsulation and bridge burning. And I also mentioned that they prevent you from contacting the outside world for security reasons, but also to prevent that countervailing pressure. 
But uh, if you ask me about the Palestinian case, there are individuals that have went back. I've met a family that heard that their son was being recruited by Hamas, and the mother got enraged and went and started you know, yelling at the recruiters and took her son and sent him to Jordan to go study there. So you do, yes, you do get all range of uh, issues. But there is a lot of true believers that also want to do it, and we know those cases that have volunteered. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take one more, um, and I already kind of, there we go. Former State Department. Mm -hmm. uh, implicit in much of what you're saying uh, in, in terms of transportation, safe mm -hmm. houses, training camps, is a need for funds. What have, in your research, what have you come up with as, as major sources of funds? Yeah, well, the, a lot of the, the volunteers actually bring their own funds. Uh, w one reason you have a lot of Saudis is they tend to have a lot of money, and so they are, they're favored by transporters, but nonetheless, even with the case in Morocco and others that we know is you are told you have to bring your own money to be able to pay the transporters. So this isn't the case where someone is paying you to do it. Uh, now, once you're in Iraq, if you're doing these camps, I mean, in Iraq, there's criminality. There's a lot of charity support from uh, countries uh, you know, nearby. Um, if you go to Umrah or Mecca or Hajj, there are people setting up booths to, to fund their resistance. It's not, you know, this is not uh, obscure, because there's a lot of people that believe what's going on in Iraq is legitimate resistance. So you do have that. But I would say the main sources of funding is internal to Iraq. There's a lot of criminality. One kidnapping would get you $60,000, things of that sort. Um, yeah. Okay. One more since we did it pretty quickly, sir. Uh, Warren, because uh, many, many Iraqis have told me that money is an important factor. It's an important factor. Uh -huh. I, I've spent a lot of time in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Four years and had a lot of discussion. Uh, the, they're of the view that, that many times uh, the families of su suicide uh, candidates are promised, or the candidate is promised that his family will be financially mm -hmm. taken care of, mm -hmm. and that this is a, an important motivation for them. Well, that might explain why Iraqis are becoming suicide bombers, but it doesn't explain why people coming from outside. The families don't know. Usually they don't get money. The one time I heard is, uh, they, you know, the, the brothers collected about 500 euros, which is hardly something worth sacrificing, you know, for. Uh, the, another story that I heard is uh, we paid his debts, because in Islam, to be a martyr, you have to have your debts paid to enter paradise. Uh, so, but none, I mean, you know, again, I think that might explain why Iraqis and maybe some Palestinians, and even there, I don't really, buy it that much. So if we look at the Palestinian case, the Israelis blow up your house. Um, your family often gets interrogated, thrown in jail, maltreated. So I'm not sure you would do it for that. Uh. Okay, we're going to stop it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mohammed. It was really um, I encourage you to come up and talk to Mohammed. Um, thanks again for coming.